Kamala Harris finally did her first interview uh, with CNN. And, and, and she said something about fracking. She said that she would not ban fracking, which obviously implies that they will keep producing gas at the rate they are going and probably produce more gas in the future. And this is something that some people find weird because it doesn't jive with her concern for climate change, which I share, by the way, I'm also concerned about climate change. But that doesn't mean that it is unreasonable uh, to keep producing gas because there's so many other elements in there that you need to consider before you can make such a decision. Banning, uh, you know, the production of natural gas simply isn't that smart at this moment. So let's see what she said. And, and, and please bear with me. I've put this the speed up so you're going to hear Mickey Mouse, Mouse voices. Uh, and, and, and then I'm going to explain why uh, banning fracking is not, you know, it, it, it is not a cure for climate change and it is actually going to hurt the United States and it's going to hurt other nations as well. Uh, so let's see what they had to say. Uh, energy is a big one. When you were in Congress, you supported the Green New Deal. And in 2019, you said, quote, there is no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. Fracking, as you know, is a pretty big issue, particularly in your must-win state of Pennsylvania. Sure. Do you still want to ban fracking? No, and I made that clear on the debate stage in 2020, that I would not ban fracking. As vice president, I did not ban fracking. As president, I will not ban fracking. I will leave it at, at that, because otherwise CNN is going to <laughs> pursue me for copyright uh, uh, theft or something like that. So uh, let's go to the U.S. Energy Information Administration website. And what we can see here is that the export of natural gas to other countries is growing. In the United States, you know, increasing their their production of natural gas and they are increasing uh, their export of natural gas to other countries now as you can see uh, I don't know if this is big enough let me let me just enlarge it for you um, so currently this is basically this graph uh, gives us the figure for billion cubic feet per day so that's a billion cubic feet of natural gas per day and they're somewhere around 22.5 billion cubic feet per day. And it's probably going up and it will keep going up uh, for quite a while. So let's look at, for instance, uh, what a an average consumer would pay for 1,000 cubic feet of natural gas in the Uni United States. You see that the price is somewhere between $9 and $16 per 1,000 cubic feet. Now, if you are going to export this gas to other countries, then you are going to move this in bulk. So there's probably some 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 reduction aspects in there that make that gas uh, somewhat uh, cheaper than for the average consumer in, in the United States. So let's just say, okay, we're going to make it a nice round figure. Let's say that the United States exports liquefied natural gas at around $10 per 1,000 cubic feet. Uh, so what, what I've done here is I've made a little, little uh, Excel sheet in, in which we explore how much that is going to yield in terms of money. Obviously, we go from 1,000 cubic feet of natural gas costing 10 US dollars to uh, having 1 billion cubic feet uh, of natural gas costing 10 million dollars. Now, if you look at it from this, this previous figure, so let's say that they're uh, exporting on average 20 billion cubic feet per day, then that would mean that the United States would make 200 million US dollars each day just from exporting liquefied natural gas. And if you then spread this out over a year, then you get a nice figure of 73 billion United States dollars. Now, what is the driver for this demand? Uh, this here is uh, a, a graph that, that basically shows it all. This is Europe's gas con consumer switch from Russian pipelines to liquefied natural gas in 2022. And the graph on the right side basically summarizes what has happened. A war was started by Putin. They invaded 
Ukraine and Europe and its allies started to impose sanctions on Russia. And one of the things that they uh, basically said was, okay, you know what, uh, we are no longer going to finance this war, so we are going to stop consuming Russian gas. Instead, what we've done is we basically have started building li liquefied natural gas terminals in Europe, and we started talking to the United States and say, okay, how much can you send over? And, and, and that's how the business started. We have significantly stopped using a natural gas from Russia. There's still some there. Uh, Romania uh, is one of the countries that, uh, or is it Hungary? I believe it's Hungary. It's still using some uh, Russian natural gas. Most countries have managed to uh, secure deals with the United States to import this liquefied natural gas from there. Now, this is not a perfect picture uh, also, this doesn't mean that we have stopped importing uh, energy goods from Russia completely. For instance, they still have a firm grasp on the enriched uranium market, for instance, which is something that uh, is being addressed right now. The United States, France, the Netherlands, uh, they've all announced and they are all working on increasing their own enrichment capabilities in order to keep our Western fleet of nuclear power reactors operational. Now, uh, this is uh, April 1st, 2024. And there you can see uh, the United States overtook Qatar and Australia as exporter of liquefied natural gas, which is pretty sizable. If, if you look at how much of that gets exported to Europe, that you can see that Europe is the largest consumer of American liquefied natural gas. There's still some uh, consumption in Japan, which is obviously one of the biggest allies of the United States in Asia, as well as South Korea. Now on our next slide, this is pretty interesting because this gives us an insight into where all the major liquefied natural gas uh, terminals are in the United States and I made a map for myself so I can see uh, where all of that is situated. Now as you can see most of it is concentrated in and around Texas. There's uh, some in Louisiana so here Corpus Christi then you get uh, to the south of Houston right I mean you get all these kinds of things so um, this is pretty interesting so here you can see this is the facility uh, where they basically basically liquefy the natural gas and then it gets to gets pumped to a terminal whether that is here or here I don't know and, and, and then it gets uh, loaded onto boats or uh, pumped into boats now this, this is all pretty interesting as you can see three ships are uh, loading liquefied natural gas and I, I mean this is basically the infrastructure that the United States has built um, it, it seems that Pennsylvania is pretty big on fracking at this moment. So, uh, obviously there is, uh, there's a liquefied natural gas, uh, terminal somewhere near there, which is uh, Cove point, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. And then what happens is all this liquefied natural gas gets transported over to, right. Uh, let's see, I believe that, uh, um, United Kingdom is the biggest, consumer then you get the Netherlands then you get then you get Spain Germany Italy and finally France uh, so this is pretty interesting this gives you an in, insight into who is getting all this liquefied natural gas also what you can what you can also see is that they have to uh, go through the Panama Canal in order to get to Japan and South and South Korea because uh, I don't see any uh, liquefied natural gas terminals on the western shore of the United States. So that's pretty interesting. So now the question, why can't we wean ourselves off, uh, you know, uh, liquefied natural gas or natural gas in, in, in general at this moment? First, what we need to look at is, you know, what does it look like from an electricity generation uh, perspective in the United States? So we see here that fossil fuels still account for 60% of all the electricity generation in the United States. Let me increase the size of this a bit for those who don't see as well. And natural gas accounts for 43.1% of all the electricity production in the United States in 2023. 
uh, you, nuclear, which is my favorite uh, energy source, uh, still provides 18.6% of all electricity. And I'm not going to act as of renewables is one big monolithic thing because it is not. It's a host of technologies. Then you get wind, 10.2%, hydropower, 5.7%. Uh, solar 3.9 and then there's still biomass 1.1 percent so when we take it from this perspective the natural gas is the largest source of electricity in the united states in 2023 uh, followed by nuclear 18.6 percent followed by coal 16.2 percent and then followed by uh, wind 10.2 and finally hydro and solar so this might come as a surprise to some, but yes, uh, nuclear is still the second largest electricity source in the United States, or at least was in 2023, and uh, the largest source of clean electricity in the United States in that year. How it is uh, in 2024 uh, remains to be seen. Now, if we look at um, a Sankey diagram. This is a very interesting diagram, which comes from the Lawrence Livermore National, National Laboratory. This is from 2022. Uh, and what you can see is basically the flow of energy. Uh, you can see the primary input. You can see what it is used for. You can see how much of, of this is being put into residential, commercial, industrial, or transportation. And then finally, you see where you have your losses and what energy has been used efficiently. Now, when we look at electricity generation, 37.7 quads, which is uh, for quadrillion BTUs, uh, you could also express it in terawatt hours, but I, I have not done uh, the math today to do this because otherwise it would take too much time. But you can see that out of the 100.3 quads of energy that is put into the economy of the United States, in the end, 67.3 quads get rejected. And when, when you look at, you know, how much uh, natural gas, for instance, is, it's almost as much uh, energy uh, that is also used uh, to produce to produce electricity you know there's 33.4 quads put into the economy um, and, and a sizable portion of that uh, gets used to create electricity and then you see those other things you know you see uh, 5.17 quads go to residential 3.65 going to commercial 10.8 going to industrial and a very small portion to transportation. Now, most of this is heating, especially in residential and commercial. Uh, when we go to industrial, however, uh, there are also non-energy uses for natural gas. For instance, you need it if you want to make ammonia uh, because you have CH4, which is natural gas. It's basically methane, uh, which then gets put into a process you basically disassociate the carbon atoms from the hydrogen atoms. You take air from, you know, the atmosphere and, and you mix that up. And what you get under tremendous heat is that the nitrogen and the hydrogen atoms start forming bonds with each other. With each other and the oxygen that comes also from the air starts forming bonds with the carbon uh, atoms, which in the end... Uh, gives you carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, all that bad stuff. But you also get uh, ammonia, which is an essential feedstock for fertilizer. So if you simply look at how big um, the natural gas block is, it's the second biggest block in here. Uh, petroleum is the biggest because, you know, to cart all everything around, we still use a lot of gas and diesel uh, for our transportation uses, even though... We are starting to electrify large portions of the, or, or we start, we try to uh, electrify large portions of our uh, personal vehicle fleet, but also the commercial vehicle fleet. Uh, I don't think it's in the cards that 
this is going to change uh, fast anytime soon. Uh, the petroleum block will remain pretty big. Uh, the natural gas block is pretty big uh, and has a sizable impact on the U.S. economy. So that's why it's not smart to ban um, gas fracking, fracking for gas, because it, there too much hinges on the use, the availability of uh, natural gas. It simply is a too big part of the U.S. economy to say, okay, let's just ban fracking because it's bad for the environment. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it, I do agree that it's bad for the environment, but it is not worth wrecking the economy and making things worse uh, than to, you know, uh, keep going the way you're going. Now, if we look at it from a world perspective, um, you know, let's 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 go to uh, another our world data website. So, what we have here, this is pretty pretty interesting. Uh, let me go there. Here you see that this is this is based. Uh, this is this is uh, data presented to us in terawatt hours. Here you can see that oil is still the biggest, which has obviously to do with transporting goods, transporting whatever we need to leave uh, to live our everyday lives, uh, goods, fuels, materials, you name it. Uh, so oil will remain very big. Uh, natural gas is on the world stage somewhat smaller. Uh, but I believe that to be a function of the rest of the world being less developed. Um, but simply put, when you look at these figures here, um, this is primary energy. So again, think about the Sankey diagram that I just show, showed you. You have the big block, the input block, then you get a line towards uh, you know, what this input is being used for. And then in the end, you get two blocks rejected and used efficiently. Uh, and this is basically the input block. And here you can see that out of the 183,000 terawatt hours a year that we use in primary energy, and I believe that this is 2023, uh, then you can see 40,102 terawatt hours of natural gas being needed to fuel whatever we do using it. Uh, it's also very sobering to see that, for instance, solar is 4,264 terawatt hours. But as you can see, um, you know, it, it, simply looking at natural gas, oil and coal, they really constitute the brunt of all the energy that we have to put into our electricity or into our energy system, our worldwide energy system, in order to make sure that everybody gets to live good lives. So yeah, um, do I agree with Kamala Harris? Do I agree that she uh, uh, is, do, do I think that she is right not to impose a ban on fracking? I absolutely think she is. Uh, doing that would be shooting yourself in your own foot as United States, uh, as being the United States is concerned. And I believe that the only way of getting rid of fossil fuels in the end is by uh, replacing them with better uh, energy resources like nuclear, like hydro, like wind and solar. Uh, and, and I still firmly believe that nuclear is going to be um, the building block upon all the rest uh, will rest. So yeah, that's uh, that's my take on Kamala Harris uh, and her position on fracking. Uh, I hope you found this video informative. If you did, uh, please leave a like and a comment below if you want to uh, support the channel you can do so uh, in patreon and i hope that i can make a lot more videos like this in the future thank you all for watching and have a nice day bye bye